Fairly innocuous clues. Got more fans than it. <laughs> Got more. I don't know. I mean, we, I, I suppose, not blow me on trumpet, but, you know, a few of us, a few of us had nice bodies, good bodies. And the girls thought it was sexy and they like looking at bare flesh, and, you know, it worked for us. All this role reversal was a nice change, but not everyone took it seriously. Right said Fred loved showing it off and they gave us plenty of camp on the side. We did it because we enjoyed it. I, I've never been a fan of the Brogues and Parker style of rock and roll, where it looks like you've just left home and you haven't made any effort at all. That, to me, is deeply boring to watch and deeply boring to actually be in. So I, that's not my thing. But, uh, yeah, we just did it because it it's fun putting on clothes. Do you like the blouse? Shirt, shirt. But as Richard discovered, this kind of camp could upset people. We had a top of Pops. And I had a black see-through body stocking and a little bit of my bum was covered, but basically my bum was out. And it was like I was just wearing this huge black stocking. And uh, we did the, did the run-through and uh, sitting in the dressing room. And then somebody from the BBC comes up and tells me I can't wear it. But I remember saying, well, hold on, if I was a woman, I could wear this. But because I was a guy and it was, I don't know what it was doing to, to other men, you know, I don't know, I have no idea. But it was definitely because I was a guy. In accordance with strict BBC guidelines, Richard had to cover his black stocking with his black PVC trousers. And the weird thing is, when we do shows, it's mostly women that I play to when we're doing shows, and they love it. I mean, I think they, they're not looking at... They're not looking at I don't think they're looking at me thinking there's a gay bloke trying to come on to me. They're looking at me as just a, a guy who's being a bit camp. Sierra smile. Pop was back, and with it, a new generation of girl groups. But when it came to being sexy, our girls were a bit shyer than the Americans. Please welcome Salt and Pepper. TLC were one of the new breed of American girl groups. They had songs about sex. You know, Left Eye had condoms attached to her, her Dago trousers and stuff. But what you have to remember, it, it was... You know, these kids had been bombarded by that age. If you were, like, 18, 19, you'd, you'd already lived through the first government campaigns about AIDS awareness and so on. So you, there was no humility about talking about sex because the government was putting leaflets through your doors saying that you have to be safe when you're having sex. We live in a world that sometimes seems to be changing too fast for comfort. Old certainties crumbling. Traditional but this permissiveness was a bit much for some. After all, Britain was still a conservative country. And people ask, where's it going? Why has it happened? And above all, how can we stop it? It is time to get back to basics. The Criminal Justice Bill in 1994 was the government's reaction to rave culture. Partygoers like Norman Cook found themselves face to face with the law. And he went, what's your problem? And I went, your problem is you've been all these people. And he just went, leave now. And I went, no, not so you start being nice to people, you know. And I, you know, and he just said, leave now or else you'd be arrested. And I said, come on, fucking nick me then. And he did. <laughs> got, done, got done for breach of the peace, bound over for a year. They tried to stump it out. It's one of those things where it just fanned the flames. The more illegal the raves became, the more people wanted to go to them. They always said that XTC did more to remove the Conservative Party than me or Billy Bragg ever did. Until now, the DJ had just been some bloke playing records. But as the club scene took off, rave created a unique bond between artist and audience. Sometimes they are actually shouting, you know, harder, faster, louder. And... So there's a communication like that, and also there's this other 
just mental communication where you just look at somebody and just smile and just go, how much fun is this? Because they can see that, uh, if you've ever seen me DJ, you see that I'm, I'm actually having more fun than the audience. And that gets into a vicious spiral because they can see me having fun, that makes them have more fun, and them having more fun makes me have more fun. And we get to a point where we just look at each other and go, how fucking good is this? Yeah. <laughs> But the club scene didn't suit everyone. I used to, used to do a lot of ecstasy, but didn't really club much. I used to sort of sit at home a lot and go off our faces. That was the kind of culture I was involved in, going to someone's house and take mushrooms or do it or something. John Major's vision of Middle England did still exist. Welcome to Haywards Heath. The kind of place that brought us the likes of David Bowie, Morrissey, and now Brett Anderson. Hayward Seath for me is, is, is a very depressing little place, and as soon as I had reached any sort of consciousness, I was determined to escape it. One of the things I used to do, lived in Hayward Seath, you sort of go to the railway station and sort of look up the tracks to London, look at the trains going to London. It was this big sort of romantic journey. I first saw Brett. Um, on the first day of, of UCL and um, he had a bob and a pair of earrings and a leather handbag and uh, I remember thinking is it a boy or is it a girl and it was basically love at first sight Brett wanted to put the edge back into sex and drugs and rock and roll I wanted to write about sexuality. I don't know why I wanted to write about it, because it obsesses me, because it obsesses everyone, because it's everything, really. There was something about him that was really unusual and slightly ethereal and quite fascinating. I would, you know, wake up and see what lyrics Brett had come up with, you know, after I'd gone to bed, and I'd always be amazed by stuff that was going through his mind. He just always had an original take on things. Brett's girlfriend, Justine Frischman, was originally part of his band, sharing his interest in androgyny. It had been creeping through in his lyrics, but it hadn't really been fully developed until actually I left the band. And then, I guess, he must have felt there was more freedom to take on the persona of both the male and the female. Um, I guess while I was there, the female was already represented in the band. And when I went, something happened. After the baggy Stone Roses Happy Mondays, you'd have this period of real underachievement. And then here comes Suede. Wow, they look great. The lyrics are about something. And then you've got all these layers of ambiguity. I mean, you know, all these male personal pronouns in love songs. Brown Anderson singing about... We kissed in his room to a popular tune. Whoa, what's this? This is interesting. I think somebody like David Bowie, and I think Brett's got it as well. I'm a big fan of Brett. It's just, just, just a sort of quality of somebody who doesn't fit into society, and somebody who is a bit scary and into perverse things that are interesting that you would like to do but you'd never dare to. Brett was on a well-trodden path. Middle-class art schoolboys trying a bit of gender bending. But the dressing up also attracted another band from a very different background. The Manic Street Preachers were from a South Wales mining community which had been broken apart in the 80s. And I wish in just one generation, Men's roles had changed completely. People would get redundancy and just spend their money getting pissed and betting. It was just tragic, actually. 